I think the most gracious accounts about Jesus of Nazareth from, from unbelieving historians, and I, I mean to say it that way, is that he was a tragic figure. I've, I've said this before, and I, I did just get that sense from reading history. They, they might freely admit that Jesus drew large crowds to his teaching, that he was known, they would say, that he, is known, he was known as a miracle worker, that he, he spoke against oppressive powers. He certainly helped the lonely and downtrodden. The historians would, would gladly say that. They would also say, though, that in the end he was rejected by the religious establishment. They had stirred up the crowds against him, and they led the Roman authorities really to acquiesce to that mob and have him crucified. Historians would say, sadly, quite tragic. Tragic. Tragic? Well, of course, John, our gospel writer, will, will have none of that. Of course, the Holy Spirit will have none of that, as this is written down for us. Our text, our Bible text here, shows us a different perspective. It is, in fact, God's perspective, and therefore, the true perspective on Jesus, that Jesus himself, the divine Son of God, the I am in human flesh, orchestrated and ordered each and every one of his steps, fully accomplishing everything that God had determined to do in the world even before the world was created. So the setting here, though John doesn't say it, is the Garden of Gethsemane. The other gospel writers tell us about that, that this is the place where Jesus prayed, he prayed asking and, and invited his disciples to pray with him. It's there that he prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me. And he, he was sweating great drops of blood. Yet he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's the place where they are across the Kidron Valley. So as you look closely at just this, this brief narrative before Jesus is ultimately crucified, before he's put on trial, this scene in the garden, I want us to look closely at this story. And I want, I want to point out three things that, that are in keeping with the fact that Jesus says, I am he. First, Jesus has complete control. Second, Jesus is truly God. And Jesus alone saves. First, Jesus has complete control. There's an aphorism. It's attributed to Francis Bacon. Um, in English, we know it as knowledge is power. You've heard that? Knowledge is power. Really, the point uh, in the saying is that ultimately knowledge helps you make wise decisions, thus giving you more control over your own circumstances. And of course, it's a useful maxim, isn't it? For us mere humans, that's useful. It helps us to, it motivates us to, to study and research. Knowledge is power. But you know, with Jesus, it's completely the other way around. Completely. Power is knowledge for Jesus. You see, when Jesus knows something, it's not simply because he was able to read the situation as it unfolded before him. Jesus knows because he controls. And John points that out in verse 4, if you look at the Bible text. What's it say there? Jesus knowing all that would happen to him. Now, I don't want to gloss over here the fact that there has been much discussion among, you know, people much smarter than me, Bible scholars, about how Jesus' human nature and his divine nature coexist in a single person. That's not a question that, that we can answer uh, or should answer this morning. I'll touch on some of that in the next point. But suffice it to say that Jesus' knowledge here in the garden, and in fact, all through his ministry, is the outworking of his divine power. That's what Jesus' knowledge is. To that point, Jesus, uh, John explains, and I just read it for us, Jesus knowing all that would happen to him. See, nothing is hidden from Jesus. He knew Judas would betray him. He knew how it would unfold because it was his plan. 
Again, Jesus knowing, and we got to get this, is not merely a, a peek into the future as if he's, he's passively looking at what's going to unfold. That's not Jesus' knowledge. And nor is it that, that human ability to, to gather intel by, by reading body language or assessing the situation. No, with Jesus, his knowing is a knowing of authority. It's a knowing of design. It's a knowing of control. The knowledge of the Almighty God that Jesus possessed cannot be divorced from his governance of all things. Do you get that? For God to know is for God to rule. For God to know is for God to have ordained it in the beginning. And what God knows, what Jesus knew, as I said, is what God ordained to be before there was anything. And the knowledge of God, that same knowledge that Jesus possessed and possesses, includes the design of God, the purpose of God, the providential working of God in all things to accomplish his own ultimate purposes. Jesus knowing there in the garden, knowing what would happen to him is the divine authority over those events, those specific events to accomplish his own purposes in salvation, knowing that how and when Judas would betray him was within his complete control. Jesus knew Judas' heart. And we can see this. What, what did Jesus do? He positioned himself, in fact, to make it easy for Judas to find him. Jesus went with his disciples, verse 1, across the book Kidron. Kidron. It's a valley. It's a, it, it might have been dry at the time. Uh, I, I can't remember what season it was, but, but in terms of what would do with the rains, but they walked across that, and it led them to this place called Gethsemane. Judas had been there many times with Jesus. That's a place where they would, they would get away and pray. And Jesus knew. Judas can find me here. Easy. Jesus also knew that Judas would bring with him temple guards and soldiers. And when, 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 when the, the band showed up, Judas and, and the soldiers, Jesus stepped forward and said, whom do you seek? He didn't wait. Who are you looking for? He effectively offered himself up to be arrested. This is Jesus in charge. And it's fully in keeping with what he said earlier in chapter 10. Remember what he said, because this is going to lead to his death, right? This is going to lead to his crucifixion. In John chapter 10, here's what Jesus said. I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it up again. What human could say anything like that? If any one of us in this room says, you know what, I'm gonna, I will decide fully when I die. And then when I die, I'm going to simply decide that I'm going to come back to life again. We'd look at that person and say, you're out of your mind. But no, Jesus, Jesus can say that. This act of giving up his life was planned even before creation. And, and Peter, Peter grasped this truth on looking back when he was preaching on the day of Pentecost. Having been filled with the Holy Spirit, they spilled out into the street. He preaches Jesus. And he says to them, Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. But he doesn't let the crowd off the hook and killed by the hands of lawless men. Who's responsible? The lawless men, or did God plan it? Yes. <laughs> That's how that works. Jesus was in charge. Now listen, brothers and sisters, if Jesus can orchestrate the events of his own crucifixion for our sins, if he can do that, then how much more, as we get to know him, can we trust him moment by moment? We, we call Jesus Lord because we mean for him to rule over us as sovereign king, don't we? 
He holds the entire universe together by the word of his power. How much more does Jesus rule over your diagnosis of cancer? How much more does Jesus rule over the uncertainties with your job? How much more does Jesus rule over the difficulties you have with your children, disciplining them, or strife in your marriage, or conflict between friends, or this pandemic, or the upcoming election, or the, the unrest that's so disturbing in this nation, the racial conflict. How much more does he rule over those things? And I've had to remind myself of these past few weeks these months, really. Jesus rules over this. And whatever's happening, whatever is happening, nothing, nothing is outside of his control. And somehow, some way, he's going to enfold it into his good plan for his own glory and our good. The Apostle Paul was reflecting on his own suffering. And he's firmly fixed in his mind who Jesus is. Paul exhorts Timothy in this way, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced, this is in regard to the gospel message, but I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. So get this. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus has complete control. Know him. He says, I am he. Delight in what has been spoken of him in the prophets. Ruminate on what has been revealed of him in the gospels. Follow Jesus through the establishment of the church in Acts. Ground yourself in a better understanding of Jesus' saving and sanctifying work in the epistles of, of Paul and Peter and John and others. And look forward to how he will complete his plan to vindicate his own name and display his own glory in Revelation. Know him. He says, I am he. He is in complete control. Know him. Second, Jesus is truly God. He says, I am he. Truly God. Now, imagine, uh, imagine someone who says he is your friend, maybe just got to know them, introduces you to another friend. I'm just going to make up a name here. And he says, this is my good friend, Trevor. Okay? He's in the Navy. Now, you're actually in the Air Force. You'll like Trev. He's into music. He plays guitar. Actually, you play piano. And his three daughters are the sweetest kids. Well, actually, he has two sons. They're good kids. You know, he recently lost his wife to cancer. He's thinking, no, she's alive and well. Everything's cool. Now, that's kind of a silly example, right? When, when we introduce someone to someone else, we should get to know some essential facts about them and not misrepresent them. Sometimes when Jesus is represented, we miss some facts about him. And that's what the world does. They, they intentionally misrepresent Jesus or they just think about Jesus in the way that they want to think about Jesus and he ultimately gets misrepresented. And, and perhaps you are clear on the facts about Jesus this morning, but there may be someone here this morning who isn't as clear Maybe someone who's watching on the live stream. You see, when I, when I meet people, and, and I will say even those who are professing believers, we interview a lot of people for working in our child care. It's mostly women, but some young men. And it's happened enough that when I ask them the question, is Jesus God? Well, Sometimes I don't get the certain answer I'm looking for. I need some coaching. And, and I think they, they believe or they want to believe and, and they're well-meaning, but they're not taught. 
that Jesus is truly God. Of course, given how John, this gospel writer, opened this gospel, it's hardly a point that, that needs to be proven, yet this truth needs to be defended. Absolutely. And, and listen, if we say we believe in him, if we say we know him, that we follow him, we should know or we should want to know what is true about him, at least as much as he has already told us in his word, and that's my point here. Now, first century people, not, not religious Jews, but just people, what you would call pagans, most people who are part of first century Greek culture, and that's the, the context that this letter first, this book, this gospel first landed in, they, the idea of gods was, was all around them. It was woven into the, the fabric of society. The Greeks, they had Hermes, Zeus, Poseidon, to name a few. The Romans had hundreds, hundreds of them. Gods of water, storms, prosperity, f- fertility, pleasure. You, there's a, a whole alphabetical list of them. You look them up. Some of those names we might recognize, others would seem more obscure. So the idea of gods was, was woven into everything that they did. Now, John, our gospel writer, and more importantly, the Holy Spirit, want us to understand that Jesus is not merely, not merely superhuman or subdivine, but that he embodies, as the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 2.9, all the fullness of deity. Looking at our text, verse 4. When Judas and the soldiers came looking for Jesus, he, that is Jesus, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? Verse 6, I love this. I just love this. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Why did that happen? Judas and these soldiers said that they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And, and it looks like in that moment that, that what Jesus did, he just cracked open the veil just a little bit and revealed a tiny sliver of his awesome glory such that the declaration, I am he, knocked them down. See, Jesus is not just a special man. He's not a flash-in-the-pan hero like historians would like to present him. No, he was and is and ever will be God. And listen, that is a distinctive Christian doctrine that we should be willing to fight for and die for. This truth will always be under attack in subtle and overt ways. It will always be under attack. Let me give you a little history of theology. Fourth century, the church, they, the church had to deal with a heresy advanced by this guy named Arius, a presbyter. He was from Alexandria. But what he did was he put forward this idea that Jesus was, the language is good, begotten of God, but at a particular point in history. Meaning, and he, and he led many people away, meaning that he, that is Jesus, a created being, was then at, at the point of his incarnation, then endowed with divinity. And so Arius would say that Jesus was God's first and greatest creation. Now, you think, well, where's that today? You have some Mormon friends? Yeah. Jehovah's Witness? Kind of. It still goes on today. People want to diminish Jesus. They want to de-deify him and make him a mere man. But that's not what the Bible says. And we've got to hold on to this and be unapologetic in it. The Apostle Paul again says, for in him... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus is truly God. Now, this deity is not to be confused with with demigods, which are are mere fiction, the the imaginative imaginative inventions of, of the human mind. No, Paul and John, the apostles, mean only deity, the deity of God Almighty. Now, we've seen through this gospel glimpses of Jesus' divinity. He turned water to wine. Who can do that? He healed the lame and the the demon-possessed. 
He claimed to be one with the Father, John 10, 30. And of course, his, his claim to the very divine name when he said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And when Jesus said that to the Pharisees, there was no, this was no confusion of tenses in Jesus' answer. His, his self-identification, I am, that's how the Lord God revealed himself to Moses. Jesus, the Son of God, is and always was with the Father and is God. The Son of God was, was with the Father before the creation of the world. Jesus was intimately, as the Son of God, and intimately evolved in speaking the creation into existence. He was, he was the voice that called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the voice that spoke the law to Moses on the mountain. And it was his voice that moved all the prophets until John and as the divine word of God, who was and is God in the beginning with God, he speaks with all the authority and decretive power of God. Jesus is truly God. And we see in just an example of this in our text, as he even fulfills his own word. John points this out. In the previous chapter, uh, Jesus had prayed. We saw this in the, in the high priestly prayer. Jesus prayed. While I was with them, he prays this to the Father. I kept them in your name. He's speaking of his disciples which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the son of destruction, Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Then in verses 8 and 9 of our text, Jesus then tells Judas and the soldiers, so, if you seek me, let these men go. Now, when John wrote this down, inspired, of course, by the Holy Spirit, he understood what Jesus was doing. He, he grasped it. It was a prophetic fulfillment Verse 9, this was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. You see, with Jesus, the thing that he declares comes to pass when he determines it to be. And if it takes time, he determined that too. There's no separation between what Jesus declares and actuality. When God spoke, let there be light, there had been to be light. Light could not negotiate whether it existed or not. It just had to be. And when Jesus said to his disciples, come follow, it's not like they could say, yeah, I'm not so sure I want to do that right now. And when Jesus calls you to himself, his voice saves you. He is God in every way. He is God in every way that the Father is God. He is God in every way that the Holy Spirit is God. He is of the same essence and one with God. We, we can take our cue from, from one of Jesus' disciples who had doubted much, Thomas. When, G, when Thomas saw Jesus in person and, and put his hands in, his, in his, or his, his own fingers in Jesus' wounds in his wrists and in his side, remember what he said? my Lord and my God. Jesus is truly God. He says, I am He. Let's worship Him unapologetically. Every time we gather in this room, Anytime we gather around, around the word, anytime we crack open our, crack open our Bibles to, to look at the scriptures, we are thinking we are coming to Jesus, who is God. Well, finally, Jesus alone saves. Jesus says, I am he. He alone saves. You know when you're trying to teach a, a little child to do something, or even maybe a teenager if you've got some of them, you know when they haven't quite grasped the task before them and you want to help, and then they kind of push you away. No, no, I've got this. No, let me do it by myself. And we don't encourage that, right? In fact, we should never get to the place in life where we're going, just leave me alone, let me handle it all by myself. It's good to have others help. But there's a realm where no one can help, and it's in Jesus' saving. No one can help. Jesus does not need our help saving us. And I know lots of people who are kind of in the, in the 
in the realm of, of Christian belief, there's a lot of people who think that they're assisting God in their own salvation. You know, if I just go to church that many times or if I, if I take that communion, God will smile on that activity and give me a, a check next to my name. And I think sometimes as Christians, we even use language about Jesus in a way that, that somehow we think of him as helping us do the thing that we're doing. So we, we work at obedience and we think, you know, I just kind of hit a wall here. Lord Jesus, why don't you come alongside me? Just give me a little bit of a help. Thank you. No, it's not that way at all. Now, I have a great deal of sympathy for Peter. Um, I, I, in this, in, as we read this, as we read this, see what he does here, we have to remember that a few hours earlier, Peter was told by Jesus, you're going to deny me three times. Before the sun comes up, you're going to deny even knowing me. I'm sure that cut Peter to the heart. Peter had already declared his, his faithfulness to Jesus. He, he, he pledged to die for him, John 13, 37. What more could he do? And maybe he's thinking, maybe in this moment, as Jesus surrenders himself to these guards and Judas is as the betrayer, maybe Peter's thinking, huh, if I let this thing go down, I'm done for too, Right? Pure speculation. But I wonder though, okay, here's, here's the moment. Here's his chance to prove his allegiance to Jesus and, and maybe even save his own skin. So what are we going to do? We're going to fight. So Peter draws his sword and starts swinging. Now, honestly, I don't think it, he was aiming for Malchus's ear. I think he was going for the kill. But Jesus intervened, verse 11. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? Luke gives us this, uh, th an another aspect of this, saying Jesus says no more of this. And what he does is he actually touches the ear of the servant and heals him. And that cup that Jesus was referring to was his own suffering and death. The Father had given it to Jesus, not his disciples. And Jesus was committed to doing it alone. And in giving himself up, never, never what is it in question, his power. Surrendering to the arrest, he never surrendered his authority. He never surrendered his divinity. Matthew records that, that Jesus, in response to Peter, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? Do you really think I can't stop this if I don't want to. And Jesus' plan to give himself up would not be thwarted by Peter's feeble show of resolve. The only rescue for Jesus' disciples, the only rescue for Peter was Jesus dying and there's no way, there's no way that any of the disciples would go to the cross with Jesus and accomplish anything. I mean, if they thought they were going to die with him, that would have been useless. They could accomplish nothing by their own death. What they needed was somebody to die for them. And brothers and sisters, that's what we have in Jesus. He died alone to save us. And while those disciples thought the story was over, Jesus alone, without any help from any of his disciples, just as he said, I have the authority to take up my life again, he emerged from his tomb alone, claiming life. And he alone gives it to all who would believe in him. Salvation, our salvation, and we know this, brothers and sisters, but it's good to, it's good to dwell in this. Jesus does not need any help saving us. Oh, yes, we respond. We respond in obedience, but, but that's not helping us. 
It's not like God looks at your faith in Jesus and, oh, that's good. Now, now what else will you do for me? No, no, it doesn't work that way. There isn't anything you can add to what Jesus has already done. In, in fact, any hint of self-righteousness, any hint that we might bring something to God for our salvation is repugnant. Jesus once told a parable about two men who went up to a temple to pray. You're probably familiar with this, but, but the one, a, 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 a Pharisee, he was standing there by himself and he was delighted with himself. And he was thanking God. He was grateful. God, thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here, already looking down his nose at this guy. That tax collector, feeling filthy before God, doesn't even lift his eyes. He knows the, the, the depravity of his own heart. He feels the weight of his sin. He knows it's ugly. And he just says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God can and is merciful to sinners. Because Jesus took it all. And listen, it's the same for our sanctification, for our growth in holiness. Yes, we, we must fight against our sin. We must flee youthful lust. We must put away uh, filthiness and rampant wickedness. We must put away bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and all malice. We must put those things. But we do this. We do this by continually looking to Jesus and his cross. He alone saves. You see, there's a kind of external obedience, a, a, a kind of a social obedience that looks good to others but still cherishes sin in the heart. You know it, don't you? You can look good on the outside, but those those things you've stored up. See, God doesn't just look at our external actions. He looks at what we're, what we're thinking. And he knows that we do not have the will in and of ourselves, to hate the thing that God hates. We shock ourselves sometimes at the, at the vile things that go through our mind that we just held on to, swirled that around, that bitter thought, that unforgiving thought, that lustful thought, that greedy thought. We shock ourselves when we see that. We can't will those away. The only way they will be eradicated from us is as we look to the cross of Christ and plead with him to make it loathsome to us like it's loathsome to God, then, then we will find a path to increasing sanctification. But it's all of Jesus. And what do we need to do? Believe. Believe. I was reminded of a hymn, an old hymn. I don't know, actually know how old it is, but I remember singing it as a child in my church where I grew up by a guy named Doan. I don't know the first name. I had to look that up. It goes like this. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh, how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, Oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. And this verse, take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Jesus says, I am he. He alone saves trust him. Jesus is in charge. He has complete control. So know him. Seek to know him more. Fill up on the word. Delight in all of the things that it says about our Lord Jesus. Jesus is truly God. So take every opportunity to worship him.
We're doing that here today. And every song we sing, we seek to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. And each and every day, just be reminded that Jesus alone saves. He needs no help from you. And that saving has, a, has a, an outworking effect in the present as it makes sin and unholiness and unrighteousness more, more ugly and more loathsome to us. Look to the cross. Look to Jesus. Crucified and raised because it's in his resurrection, brothers and sisters, that we have that promise of new life, eternal life that holds us for a day when Jesus will return and grant to us by his eternal grace new bodies that will in absolute and unrestricted freedom give praise and glory to the Lord Jesus forever and ever. But until that day, trust him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus and we thank you for, for who he is as God he is worthy of knowing, he is worthy of worship, and he is worthy of being trusted because he is, I am. So Father, we thank you. Thank you for your measurable grace to include us in your family. Strengthen us now to, to live in a way uh, in this world where we represent him well and point others to his goodness and grace. We pray all these things for the glory of Jesus. Amen.